Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Amen. Yes. Yes, Lord. Jesus. Highest name. All authority. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord of my family. Thank you, Lord of my family. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Jesus. Yes. Amen. That's right. Yes. I speak Jesus to Paul. I speak Jesus to Sarah over that marriage. I speak Jesus to Lenny. Jesus over the family, Lord God. I speak Jesus, Lord, over my body and my marriage. I speak Jesus, Lord, over my hands. As if we're in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Speak Jesus. Sorry, I was off. But speak the name of Jesus. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Come on. Thank you, Lord, all of you. Hallelujah. Speak Jesus. Speak Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You are not backed into a corner, but the enemy is. Amen. Yes. When you speak the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise Jesus. Praise the Lord. We welcome you here today. This morning, we're going to go to the Word. This morning, and just continue to speak the name of Jesus over every situation, every circumstance, everything in life. In the name of Jesus, darkness flees. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Victory comes. Hallelujah. Chains fall away. That is the name of Jesus. Today I want to introduce a new series. I've been contemplating this for a while and I believe that God has, has given me a way to express this and share it with the church. And as we, as we walk in these days and through this series, I believe God is going to unlock things in our hearts and in our spirits and change in our lives right in our lives, my life, in my family, in my church, and in my community is going to change. Amen? So the, the series title is Church, Let's Start a Revival. Come on, church, let's start a revival. This is part one of eight. If we get through them all, or if we extend it, that's where we were planning on going. You know, there's, there's this, this thing that we live in a sense of frustration with regards to revival. We know something is about to happen. We also know something should happen. We also want something to happen. We've heard of revival but we haven't tasted it. And we long for it because of what we have heard about revival. We want to see an act of God in our day. We do not plan on giving up on our generation. Come on. We do not plan on giving up on our generation. 
Hallelujah. They can tell us all kinds of things about this generation and generations to come. But we who have been placed on the earth in this time for this generation have no intention on giving up on our generation. I hope we haven't already. And say, oh, because if we give up on them, we say, Satan, you can have them. That's what we're saying. And I say, no, not on my watch. Not in my lifetime. As long as I'm here on earth, I will stand and oppose this. And if you will stand and oppose it with us, then we've got some agreement on this. Amen? Amen? Yeah. We will not give in to the present evil, no matter how, in what form it comes. We will take back what we have handed over. Now listen to that. I'm not saying what the enemy has stolen. We'll take back what we have handed over. Because we've given over some things that were never meant to be given over. But you know what? We can take them back. Hallelujah. And we do that in Jesus' name. The question is, are we discontent enough? I can go on and talk about things that might make us discontent. But are we discontent enough to disrupt our lives enough to serve God in this generation? Are we discontent enough? Have we come to the place where we say, enough already? I don't care how much it costs me as far as disrupting my life. I want to see God move. And that's a question that I've asked myself. That's one of those tough questions. And the truth is, not yet. But you have to answer for yourself. See, it feels a bit like Haggai describes things in Haggai chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. That's, that's where we're going to go look at a little bit today, but we're, we're going to go on to a number of other things. But Haggai says this, this, chapter 1, Haggai chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, this is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look at what's happening to you. You have planted much, but harvest little. Now, this is a stewardship scripture, and it's more than, you have to be in on the Sunday morning stewardship to understand what God's saying to us there. I'll miss those, not for anything. Because God is doing a work in this church. And He's lacing truth together so that we can grow up in Him. This is a stewardship scripture. Look what's happening to you. You have planted much, but harvest little. You eat, but you are not satisfied. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but you cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear though you, as though you are putting them in pockets filled with holes. Only one of those speaks of finance, but all of them speak of stewardship. And I believe that as we come to a time, and this time, we're looking at what God is doing and where we have been. And we say, God, we have poured ourselves in. We have poured ourselves out and we have no fruit for what we have done. And God says, take a look what's happening to you. Take a look at what's happening to you. Now, go and read the context of this and you'll see that Haggai lays out a whole lot of things and that's not where we're going today. But the point is that we have worked, we have sold, we have, we have poured, but what has happened is we have not done it God's way to this point. We have not done it as we should. We have skirted the issues that truly touch our hearts. Let's not do that any longer. See, the Holy Spirit has not abandoned us. 
We may have abandoned him, but he has not left us. And when it comes to revival, well, let's put it this way, there is no substitute for revival. And right now, I believe there's no alternative but revival. We speak, when we speak of revival, we're looking for a move of God. A move of God's Spirit. Some kind of divine intervention into our world and into our life that will come and disrupt us to the extent that we will just see the miraculous move. What are revivals and how do they happen? And God has, the question is, has God given us a plan for, for revival? Has God laid it out somewhere in the scripture that we can get a hold of and say, yes, here's a plan, here's a pattern, here's something that we can work with, here's a scripture. I believe God has, and we'll lay that out through the series. God has, in fact, given us steps we can follow. God is like that. He doesn't leave us, say, well, just, just, just make it up as you go. Now, certainly God wants us to hear from Him clearly a fresh word, a fresh revelation, but it will never be outside of His word. It will never be something that you can go and find from a dictionary or you can go and find in some other publication. It will always be from the life-giving words of God. Amen? But before there can be, before any great awakening or revival can come, the truth is there has to be a rude awakening. And we have not got there yet. Ever had a rude awakening? I hate those. But I believe that we're, we've got to get there. That thing that so upends what we thought was right, we thought was in place. We need that kind of thing happening in our lives. Before we get a great awakening, we're going to have to have a rude awakening. Who wants a rude awakening? In terms of what I just said, I say yes. I don't want to experience it, but I want what it will bring about. I want what God says will come from it. Now the key to revival, the pattern for revival, The plan for revival can be laid out in this popular scripture, this well-known verse, this verse that we know so well that we do no longer hear it when it is spoken. We no longer listen to it when it comes. We no longer pay attention because we can ramble it off, and sometimes we ramble it off, including myself, and we misquote it. We think we know it, but... There it is, and, and, and the problem with well-known scriptures is that when, when we speak them or read them, we have a way of dismissing them before they penetrate our hearts. Let's not do that this time. The series will be based on this scripture. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. Now, I'm sure that, that if I asked you, can you quote it? You probably could, and depending on the translation you quote it from, for the most part, they're pretty much the same. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. There's a lot of ands and they all are there to make certain points for us.
that before we get into the how of revival, I think that we need to look at some points, some issues that perhaps keep us from getting there. One of those things might be as simple as, as looking at, at this verse and dismissing it. But what are the attitudes that could block revival? Now, I'm sure you could come up with a few more. I'm sure that I could come up with, with extras, but I don't want to go a list of, yes, a hundred reasons or a hundred ways that revival is blocked in our lives, and what we do is we get lost after number five. So we're going to break them down to just, just a handful. But you could, if, if you feel impressed by the Spirit of God, that there is another area that you are being stirred in by the Holy Spirit, by all means pay attention to it. Don't dismiss it and say, well, it's not one of the five the pastor said, so I don't have to care about it. Holy Spirit will come and he will, he will put his finger on a specific place in your life and say, what about this one? Don't dismiss it. Say, God, you can have it. You can have it. Speak. Thank you, God, for the rude awakening. Because what's coming is a great awakening in my life. Now, the first thing is that, is that we want teaching. But not training. I want you to think about that. We want teaching, but not training. What's the difference? First, it sounds a bit like we're playing with words here. But you see, I don't know about you, but I love to hear deep truth. I love to hear something new. I like a revelation. Right? Just listening to... to Tony Evans this morning, there were things that were like, wow, that's good, that's good. So it feeds my soul, it feeds my spirit. I like that. How many of, how many of us are there? Huh? And yes, it is a trick question, but, but just be honest, right? Come on, I'm not going to say it's not a trick question. Just be honest. Yeah, we like to hear, we like to hear deep truths, we like to have revelation, but the thing is, we do not like to implement it. We do not like to get to the place where we say, oh, that means that from now on, that thing that I have been doing, I have to make this adjustment. I have to change this thing. That's where we struggle. We can hear truth all the time. See, many of us can become, become message junkies. I don't know what else to call it. You know, some people jump from church to church, wherever, wherever there seems to be something exciting. They, they'll go, they'll, they'll go through all the neighboring churches, wherever something is exciting and fun and whatever. Or scouring the internet for some, some kind of new thing going on. Or listening to Christian TV and waiting, is there something coming? There's this, there's this speaker, there's this, this ministry that I like. And I'm not saying any of that's wrong to do, but what I'm pointing out, what I believe that we need to look at, is, is what we're looking for the next revelation. We're looking for more learning, more information. But we're not looking to do more. We get to the point where we wallow in what we know, but we have no application for the truth. We have all this information, but our obedience is narrow and not there. This happens to all of us. Now, I'm not saying that you must, you must stop searching for truth. I'm saying, well, what, what needs to happen, I believe what God is saying to us, is that we need to come to the place where we say, God, I will obey your word. I will apply truth to my life, and I will, I will, I will allow you to rudely awaken me in areas of my life that I've become comfortable with, that I've simply gained the knowledge. You know, I heard something said once before, and it, 
It's kind of funny, and I've mentioned it here before, but the thing is, we can all have truth that we can apply to someone else's life in the form of advice. But we can also find that we don't apply that same advice to our lives. So I could say to somebody, yep, I, you know, they might say, well, you have some advice on this? Yes, I have some advice. I'm not using it anyway. Right? But it's time that we get to the place we say, no, no. God's word is calling us higher and calling us further. You see, sometimes we want salvation, but we don't or we reject discipleship. You want to be saved, but we don't want to be a disciple of Jesus. What's the difference? No accountability, no follow through. Ezekiel 33 31 says, They love to hear your words but they will not do them. Ezekiel 33, 31. Training is what we need. Training is different from teaching because to train somebody requires them to perform. Training has at least two parts. Theory. So as we go through the series, we're going to look at theory because that's probably all that we can do here in the sanctuary is we're going to go to theory. But then there must be practice. Practice so that we can... And we practice it until we come to a level of proficiency. And to, to know that we are proficient, we have to pass some tests. And then, only then, can somebody be considered trained. Now, I know the rest of you are going to say, well, you know what, how long is this series? Eight weeks, I'm just going to stay home and I'm not coming. This is part of what we need to do. Now, it's not going to be stringent and strict in, in that, that form. We're not going to run around the church and tell you to come in boots and and things like that. We're not going to turn it into an army camp. But it's important for us to know that if we want to move from, we have to move from theory, from what we know, to what we do. We know this very well. Right? You wouldn't simply let somebody treat you for an illness or disease who's just read WebMD. Right? 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 Some of us do that to ourselves. We diagnose our own problems through WebMD and we get it wrong. But, but that is not the way. We would not just go to somebody and say, and they say, we'll say, what are your qualifications? Oh, I read WebMD on your symptoms today. It's like, no, can I actually see somebody who, who is qualified, please? Right? Right. So it's important for us to, to, to know that we have to move from theory to practice to where we begin to do. In our case as Christians, that means that we have to allow ourselves to be discipled. Now, you're not becoming my disciple. We're all disciples of Jesus Christ. So we get out of the classroom and we go outside into the world. We go outside to where it matters. Okay? In Luke chapter 6, verse 46 to 49, Jesus, Jesus is speaking to the crowds. He's speaking them to the people there. And he says, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord? I just thought about this. Why Lord, Lord? Why not just Lord? Emphasis. Oh, Jesus is my Lord. He's my Lord. He's my Lord. Emphasis when you don't do what I say. Those are scathing things to hear. That's, that's like, oh God, I want to hide when it comes, when I hear that. Now we know well the rest of the portion. It goes on from verse 47. 
And I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, listens obviously is not just here, but it listens to my teaching and then follows it or, or obeys it. Verse 48, it is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays a foundation on solid rock. And when the flood waters rise and break against the house, it stands firm because it is well built. Verse 49, but anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like the person who builds a house on the ground without foundation. When the floods sweep down against the house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. I don't want a heap of ruins. Foundations are expensive to build. But the house is what gets the praise. Right? What a beautiful house. We don't drive down the road and say, Wow, doesn't that house have a great foundation? Don't you just love it? We don't even see it. But the foundation is hearing and obeying. That's what holds it all together. So what we have to do is, is, is the word that comes to us, the, the scriptures that we know, the truth that we have available to us, we have to steward them to the place where they become things that we do. Where, they, where we begin to obey them. We need revival training. A boot camp, so to speak, where we are broken of our independence and we realize that our performance directly impacts our lives, directly impacts our families, directly impacts our church, directly impacts our community. It has a direct impact on what happens. And so when we get to the place that we, we understand this, we will begin to operate differently. You know what? Not truth. I'm not going to take in truth simply so that I can hold it as information. But I'm going to release it in practice. Okay, so the one thing, the first thing that, that, that troubles us when it comes to revival is that we want to hear things we want teaching but we do, even revelation but we don't want to practice it we want salvation but not discipleship secondly when it comes to revival I've, I've thought about this a lot and I've, I've been guilty of this one myself that we think of well those people back in in the Sousa Street time those guys, they had, they were, um, they had an advantage over us. They were a better quality kind of Christian. There was something special about them. Now, you might not think about that of Azusa Street, but, but you might think, well, well, those in the upper room, those 120, on the day of Pentecost. Well, those guys, they were super special. They had some kind of advantage over us. And you can go every revival and you can begin to think that. But that is a trick of the enemy. It's a tactic of Satan. And what does it do? It discourages us or disqualifies ourselves in our own minds. You see, it plays into this thing where, where it, we, we begin to think, well, I can't have it. I can't have it. I'm not good enough. I don't qualify like they did. Or, I can't have it now. I have to wait. Because sometime down the road, things will be different. Things will be better then I can have it. So I must wait. And so we wait. 
and we wait and we wait and we wait and we get sick of waiting or we get told well if it if it comes and, and it if you get it it will not last it's going to be a flash in the pan it's here today and gone tomorrow and what's the what what does that tell us what's the point What we need to understand is that we are unique in God's economy, in God's way of working in time and space. We are uniquely planted. We have been uniquely thrust into 2021 to bring about God's truth. To the earth. God chose us, handpicked us, selected us for this time. If it's not, if it was not so, you would have been born in a different time and generation. But no, God knows you, and He said to you. For he says of you, I have chosen you. You are my chosen vessel. You are my selected one. And I have brought you into the kingdom. Those popular, famous words for such a time as this. And to think less than that is to put ourselves in a place where we will not say, yes, Lord, use me. We will say, we will live live in the thing of God, pass me over, pass me over. There's got to be someone better than me. The other thing is, is that we think, well, you know, we... Well, yes, this is God's design. We, we live in a time of technology and, and amazing things, and we can do incredible things with the technology that we have to win the world, right? Think about that smartphone that you carry in your pocket or your bag or, or you have with you much of the time every day. Think of that device. It has immense power to, to spread the gospel, right? Amen? It does? Yeah? Do we use it for that? So therefore, the fact that we have technology is no advantage over those who didn't. Because though they didn't do it, they used God's design for every revival And the only way that we will see it work is if we go to God's design and then use what we have in our hand. God's design is timeless and it rests on the individual who obeys God. See, only the Holy Spirit can open the hearts of people. And that was true. In the book of Acts, that was true at Azusa Street, and that is true today. Only the Holy Spirit can open the hearts of people. And what we need is a move of God's Holy Spirit. But don't get stuck there. The other thing is that the third one is that we could think that revival is an unachievable state of bliss and perfection. In other words, that, that we have to get, we have to rise to a state of, of where everything is going just perfectly well, then revival happens. To have this idea is, is to, to think and begin to believe that revival is nearly impossible. That is, that's a fault in our thinking. It's one that we have to break away. Revival is achievable and it doesn't operate in perfection. 
You can write that down. You can take it to the bank. Revival is achievable, but it doesn't wait for perfection. It doesn't operate in perfection. It doesn't wait for perfect people. Grace and mercy have saturated every single past awakening and revival and will the present and the next. It will be God's grace and God's mercy that will overwhelm and be overwhelmingly present. Revivals are a dramatic mingling of God's mercy and the incompetence of His people. I want you to think about that. Because what we think is that, that I have to achieve some level of perfection before God will use me, and that creates a block. What I simply have to do is I have to begin to say, God, I will obey you in the next thing you ask me. In the one thing that you say, I will begin to do it. I will not wait for perfection. Now certainly our imperfections will draw attention quicker than the things that God does through us. But God's hand of mercy and His grace moving on imperfect saints is what sparks a great move of God. Now certainly, let's not say, well, yeah, there we go. We can just live imperfect lives. We can never strive to, to be more holy. We can never, we can never begin to, to put the word in. Those statements already contradict what we have said up to this point. But the idea is that I have to get it all together before God can use me is the real problem. No. How many of you got it all together? Let me just see. I just want to see everybody that has it all together. Oh, okay. Let's do this a different way. How many of you don't have it all together? Okay, so, so now most of the hands went up. So some of you are undecided. But everyone who raised their hand, or, or at least agreed some way, that I don't have it all together, you qualify to bring about a revival in your generation. All you have to do is sign up and say, yes, yes, Lord. It's not waiting for some great man or woman of God. In fact, in the past, if you go and study the nitty-gritty of revivals, you will find those great revivalists were less than perfect people. They had their flaws, they had their quirks, they had their problems. And sometimes that all gets hidden in in the, the dramatic and the miraculous. Now certainly we're not going to go and fish for the weaknesses of those that God used and say, there, there you go. So, so it was a false revival. It wasn't really true. No, the fact is what that should do, it should encourage us that, that though I struggle, though I still fall over my own two feet sometimes, God is able to use me. God is willing to pour out His Spirit on me. And therefore, what is required is that I'm available. You see, when we only see the human side, the faults, then what happens is we dismiss the move of God. When we, when we see only the power of the, the revivalist ministry, and what happens is we elevate them to a point and then suddenly we think it's unachievable for us that we can never get there. We must learn that God doesn't wait for perfection. He waits for surrender. Will I surrender today? The fourth one is, the, is this one and I can, I, can, I can wax long on this, but I'll try not to, is, is the abuse of end-time prophecy. And don't get me wrong, Jesus is returning. Jesus is coming back, and I believe it with all of my being. But there is an approach to end-time prophecy that gives defeatism a cloak of decency. 
In other words, that, that the whole idea that, that because Jesus is coming back soon, and all of the evidence and signs according to, to the prophetic theory that is stated that, that Jesus is coming back, what that does is it makes me focus on Jesus who is coming, but not on what I have to appear before Him over. Because when Jesus comes, He's coming for His church. He's coming to bring His church to Himself. He's coming to, to a place where we will face the judgment of God. And Jesus will stand there and He will judge us by what we have done. But what happens is the space between our knowledge and our excitement about the return of the Lord and the judgment throne, what happens in that gap is we begin to be completely complacent. For some reason, you'd think it's the opposite. You'd think that we would get all excited, we would get down, but what it, it's this fatalism that comes through the modern end-time prophetic movement and theory that's out there that causes the mighty church of Christ to not be busy about, with fathers, about Father's business. There's a fatalism in prophecy, in the prophetic movement, not in the prophetic word of God, that robs us of divine opportunities in a time when they most need it. You see, it's not that Satan gets his day. My focus is not on him. My focus is on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is my focus. And, and the thing that needs to happen is that is where I need to turn myself. See, the corruption in the world in the last days, we can look at it, you can find the scripture, they will be this way in the last days, we can get there, but what happens is that it becomes an excuse for a fearful, incompetent, or then an untrained church of God. I think it's time we shake this thing from us and say, God, I, I am not going to live this way. Jesus is coming but I'm not only concerned about, am I ready for his arrival? But, oh God, there are people around me that are not ready. And what I need is a sense of urgency over their souls. We cannot violate Scripture simply to justify our failures. See, things are going to get worse and worse. The Bible tells us that. But in Matthew 24, 14, it says, this Jesus says this, and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. Now, there was a possibility of, of that happening. It is more possible now than ever. Right? You want to speed the coming of the Lord? Don't hunt for Antichrist. Preach the gospel. <clears throat> Preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. It's that comprehensive rule of God over every, every area of my life. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm paying attention to. The assignment is to shake the earth with the good news of God. The gospel is to shake the earth and not be silent in the places that the world tells us we should be. In fact, we've got to get a little rowdy, a little noisy. Scripture tells us it can be done, it must be done, and God wants to do it through us, through willing vessels. But you know what? If the vessel is not me, or the vessel is not you, then God will find another vessel who will say, use me. Now, I don't know how you feel, but I don't want to be passed over because I, I simply 
remained passive or gave in to the excuses for not being part of what God wants to do. If we get too fixed on avoiding or escaping the current situation, we will never step up to be the offensive church. The church that moves, the church that's on the move. Satan will overwhelm us. And what a strange sight it would be. Think about it. We're the church of God, right? Church of Christ. We're an army. We sing it. There's an army rising forth, right? Rising up. We're that army. Amen? Amen? We're those soldiers who have set aside the affairs of this world so that we can do the purpose of the one who called us. That's us. We're that army. But we showed up for battle with a sword in our hand and flip-flops on our feet. We're not ready for the battle. We didn't come prepared. We got a sword in our hand. We got the Word of God in our lives. But we're going to the beach. Now we would never do that. A soldier that shows up the battlefield in, in flip-flops will find himself in serious trouble. Now, I'll skip that one. Let's move on. But before we ask for revival, we must believe that it is possible, that it is probable, and that it is for us. Not for someone else, but for us here in Walpole. Number five, and this will be the final one that I will share on. Handful, right? We'll stick it with a handful. You may find others. Spiritual complacency. Where we turn a deaf ear to God, He will rise, raise up someone else to finish the work. He will raise another generation up to finish the work. But it will get done. And let's not come and accept a mediocrity a lesser standard in our lives than we know God is expecting. That the Word of God demands. One thing that we do talk about, and we will talk more about that as we go, is, is that we, we spend some time hearing Scriptures and encouraging ourselves and each other that you were fearfully and wonderfully made, that you are, you are magnificent, that God loves you. He loves you so much that He gave His Son to die for you. And so what happens is we get this understanding of how, how God focused on us to redeem us and to save us. And, and we, we, we find ourselves in this bubble of feeling wonderful about who we are. And it's okay to know who we are in Christ. But we are not just to, to, we are not just to carry the name of Jesus. We are to carry the campaign of the Master. We are to follow through and go to battle for Him. But what happens is that we get to the place. I know what happens for me is that we, we let good enough be good enough. We let good enough be our standard. And I believe God is saying that if we want revival, we're going to have to give the extra bit. We're going to have to go the extra mile. We're going to have to stretch to the place where it's going to cost us more, where, it's going to, where, it's going to, where more is going to be expected of us, and that we begin to expect more of us. Otherwise, we just grow up with an exaggerated uh, I, um, self-importance. And we have no action, we have no urgency about us. God is timeless. His word is timeless. But He always approaches us in the now and the today. Today. 
in the now. God comes to us now. Today, if you hear my voice. Now is the time. God comes to us and he doesn't, he doesn't, what he said yesterday is of importance. And what he might say to us tomorrow will be amazing. But when God speaks today, that is the point of action for us. That's the place of urgency. Now I know that we might say, I'm already doing everything I know to do. I'm already giving all I can. I'm already whatever it is that you say. I have no more capacity to give myself to this situation. There's another lie of the enemy. You see, God doesn't simply say that we have to stop living life and, and just stop everything else to this. But the point will be that everything else hinges on this first relationship, this first responsibility to God. It cannot be that God orbits our lives. We have to orbit Him. And until we get Him as the center, we will actually struggle, stumble, and fail over and over again. Think about the rich young ruler. I don't want to go and, and, and get into that. The thing about the rich young ruler wasn't, first of all, his money. It was his heart. It was his heart. He did everything, or he followed all the rules, but his heart never belonged to God. His heart belonged to his possessions. Our hearts need to belong to God. That's where it starts. And that's the difference of who do we orbit? Who, who is the center of our being? Who is the center of our lives? That you find in Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 22. We can read about that as well. Listen to these words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. It's the amplified version that I've got here because it Obviously, it amplifies it. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to follow me, how many want to wish, wish to follow Jesus? He says in, the, in parenthesis, it says, as my disciple. Let me just see how many want to do that again. This is not a trick question. This is a biblical question. He must deny himself. Set aside selfish interests and take up his cross, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come, and follow me, believing in me, conforming to my example, and in living, and if need be, suffering, or perhaps dying because of faith in me. That's what the cost is, to be disciple. It's not good enough that we make it all the rage. The theme of every new song or new album that's out there to want revival. When we only say or sing that we want something in some kind of symbolic effort to bring about revival, we're only deferring hope. We're making our hearts sick. It's not enough to want it. It's just not enough to want it. Our worship, our prayers, our Bible reading, our study is focused on how we feel rather than what God demands. Think about that. That is the idea that we want teaching 
but not training. And that we want salvation, but not discipleship. We look for promises, but not instructions. But that should change, right? Once, once, we, once we figure out the problem, once we've got the diagnosis down, once we've, we've, we've figured out where the faults are, we can begin to make the corrections. And so today, I simply want to share some of the, the, the check engine lights of our lives so that we can begin to, to diagnose through the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, and say, God, release me of these things. Break these chains that bind me, these mindsets that, that have me in a place of, of defeat, that have me in a place of, here we go again. But God, release me from that. Because what I really want is I want to see a move of God in my generation and in my time. See, it's a, real, it's a time to ask disturbing questions about, about why we always seem to want something but never intentionally go after it. Perhaps what we need is we need to overcome, as someone put it, our religious childhood diseases so that we can move along in what God wants to do. Now that leaves us to the end of our first part. So for us to be trained, hopefully you took notes, and if you didn't take notes, the video is available. Take notes, watch it again, and say, God, here, what are the action points that I need to make in my life to counteract these conditions? Any and all of these conditions and mindsets that live in me. Now, this is where it goes from theory to training. Take the next week or so and say, God, I need to identify the problem areas. Help me. Pray about it. Note them. Mark them down and say, God, this is where I need the most help. That we take the theory to practice. And when we gather again, we should be further along. Amen? Amen. I know this is not one of those shouting sermons where you get all excited. In fact, these, this might be the one that says the next time he shows up, I don't want to. God, help us. You know, this is, this is boot camp. We don't get to go AWOL. We get to show up, and we say, present and accounted for. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Lord, that we can, Lord, we can move this way. Lord, this is, this is gravely important. This is so, so important important, Lord, that we will, we will shed mindsets, break loose from concepts, from theories, from, from even theologies that have held us captive. Lord, what we desire is to be set free. Lord, to truly serve our generation in our lifetime. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that every rude awakening of our, in our soul and in our spirit and in our lives, Lord, would be a point of major breakthrough that will lead us to live life for you as you intended. We pray this in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen.